Hi, we're going to be discussing uh, some of the scaling techniques. Now, since we've gone through the assessment instruments, we are going to be starting with your green instruments now, which are your scalers, and then your yellow, which are your curettes. And this is all about super gingival and sub gingival scaling. So let's talk about the scaling first, and then we can talk about the instruments themselves. Super gingival means that these deposits are located coronal to the gingival margin. That means above the gum line, usually on the crowns of the teeth, sometimes on the roots of the teeth if there's visible recession as well. Sickle scalers and curettes are recommended for light supragingival deposits. Sickle scalers, which are your green, your periodontal files and powered ultrasonic devices are used for heavier deposits. So this is a typical patient that you're going to be seeing. Uh, light to moderate calculus on the mandibular anterior. So you can see that there's some crowding. What instrument would you want? Would you want a rounded toe? Would you want a pointed tip? How would you attach that? Or what about something like this? This is somebody who has calculus not only all along the gum line area, but on the occlusal surfaces as well. So this is heavy super gingival calculus, and I would not want to have to do this all by hand. But the good thing is a lot of it comes off in sheets when you start peeling it off. This is somebody who does not have opposing teeth. They don't have the antagonist on the mandibular arch. So the teeth don't have the capability of doing any self-cleansing while they're eating. So the, the food, the biofilm, the bacteria just all sticks to it. So let's talk now about the essentials of super gingival calculus removal. Uh, you need to be thinking about the tooth itself and the angle of the instrument, the working end, and all of those things coming together. So you need the placement of the working end against the tooth. The clinician must picture the cross section of the tooth Where's the tooth? What's the cross section of the working end of the instrument as well? And what does that root surface, the periodontium, look like? This is what you're scaling around underneath the gum tissue generally, but in the gingival sulcus and a healthy periodontium, you're just doing a light stroke. But for super gingival calculus, it's going to be above the gingiva, which is good. So, the working end of a sickle scalar. It's a scalar because it's triangular in cross section and it has, it comes to a point. The point is called a tip. You need to have correct angulation of the instrument in relationship to the tooth. So angulation refers to the relationship between the face of an instrument and the tooth surface. So calculus removal, the face to tooth surface angulation has to be in an angle between 45 and 90 degrees. You need to know that, 45 to 90. And with correct angulation, the cutting edge can actually bite into the calculus and fracture the deposit off the teeth. So the angulation is less than 90, okay, but 45 to 90 is what this is um, saying. For calculus removal, take a look at this picture. Now, this is a different cross section. This is a curette because it has a rounded back here, but the calculus removal, angulation for calculus removal is ideally 60 to 80. It's acceptable 45 to 90, but 60 to 80 is ideal. And that is what you need to know. What is acceptable 45 to 90, but the ideal is 60 to 80. And that's what you're striving for. What happens if you don't have correct angulation? Incorrect angulation of the working end can result in some harmful things. Uh, if you've got more than 90 degrees, that one cutting edge will contact the lining of the pocket. And then you're doing gingival curatage or damaging the tissue. 
angulation less than 40 degrees where the face is really uh, facing the root surface, the cutting edge will slide over the deposit. So you have to find that sweet spot. This is with an angulation greater than 90 degrees. Look at where the other blade is. If this was going underneath the gum tissue, this blade would be against the lining of the pocket epithelium and you'd be scraping gum tissue and not the tooth surface and you're sliding over the deposit. If you're too closed, if you're less than 45 degrees, you're again sliding off the calculus. This end, this lateral and face edge can't bite that deposit to snap it off. But this is how you want to go in when you're introducing your instrument underneath the gum tissue. You want a closed angle to get it underneath the gum tissue. Then you open it up to that 60 to 80 degrees and you can snap the deposit off. So angulation is the relationship between the face of the working end and the tooth surface. The correct angulation for calculus removal is between 45 and 90 degrees. The ideal angulation for calculus removal is between 60 and 80. Incorrect angulation for calculus removal can result in tissue injury or incomplete calculus removal. There are different forces that you're putting on the instrument. One is a pinch pressure, another one is stabilization, and then the third is lateral pressure. All of this is needed for calculus removal. Pinch pressure is talking about the pressure exerted between the fingers in your modified pen grasp holding the instrument. You're actually grasping with your fingers the instrument tighter. That's your pinch, pinch pressure, excuse me. Stabilization is the act of preparing for an instrument stroke by locking the joints of the ring finger and pressing the fingertip against the tooth surface for more control, All right? So your fulcrum finger acts as a support beam for the entire hand during the instrumentation stroke. And the hand is stabilized by pressing down with the fulcrum finger against the tooth. So if you're one of those individuals that has very loose joints and your straight fulcrum finger all of a sudden pops and uh, will, will distend out, overextend, that can be putting your patient in jeopardy of having damage done to their um, soft tissue. So you want a nice stabilized fulcrum. And then the lateral pressure is created by applying pressure with the index finger and the thumb inward towards the instrument handle. So you're pressing against that tooth surface. It's created by applying pressure with the index finger and the thumb inward towards the instrument handle. And you apply lateral pressure prior to and throughout your instrumentation stroke. Now you've done your probing and that is a feather light touch, your exploratory stroke. You've done your exploring, again, feather light stroke, very little or no lateral pressure at all is needed. And you find the deposit, then you have to go underneath the deposit and you apply lateral pressure, increase your stabilization with your index finger, that type of thing. You apply lateral pressure and then you can snap it off. So assessment requires feather light touching against the tooth versus calculus removal. You have firm pressure against the tooth and root debridement or root debridement has less lateral pressure than calculus removal. It's more than assessment, less than calculus removal because you don't want to be scaling off all of the cementum when you're in there. You're trying to smooth out that root surface to remove um, the debris as well as smooth it out a little bit without removing it. So it's kind of the in-between. So what happens if you're not applying adequate lateral pressure? 
effective calculus removal depends on firm lateral pressure, correct angulation, and correct adaptation of the tip third or toe third of the cutting edge. Inadequate lateral pressure can result in incomplete calculus removal. Inadequate angulation, correct angulation, can result in burnished calculus where you've smoothed it. You haven't removed it, you've just made it glassy like smooth and then it's very difficult to remove. So a working stroke is a definitive stroke. You want to relax in between your strokes. So finger muscles should be relaxed between the strokes. Finger muscles should be relaxed when returning the working end to the base of the pocket. You're going in lightly and consistent pressure on the fulcrum finger or on the instrument handle really is going to create too much stress. You're going to tire yourself out and you're going to make your patient not like you as their dental hygienist because you're going to hurt. You're going in and you're just scaling, 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 and you're a heavy handed scaler, whether there's calculus there or not. So there's that balance of trying to feel where the calculus is. Oh, there it is. You go down underneath the calculus, you open up your angle, you increase your stabilization and your pressure against the tooth and you snap the calculus off. So pause and relax your fingers between each stroke. And we're going to show you that. So the three forces that must be balanced as you prepare for an effective instrumentation stroke is your fulcrum finger is straight and supporting the hand. Your fingers are not separated. The fulcrum finger presses down against the tooth surface. And then your index finger and your thumb press inward against the handle which is then going to increase the pressure against the tooth surface. What strokes do you use? Okay, we want effective calculus removal strokes. So often um, calculus deposits are too large to remove in a single piece. So removing only the outer layers of deposit is called burnishing. We're still, we're smoothing out that layer that's next to the root surface and it's very difficult to remove once it's burnished. And then the plaque biofilm continues to live on the remaining burnished deposit. And that smooth burnished deposit is even more difficult to remove because it's slippery, it's smooth. It doesn't have those edges. So you want to avoid that burnished calculus by removing it all and that means that you're taking your instrument and you're going underneath the deposit, then you're opening the angle and you're snapping it off, trying to snap off the calculus. Large calculus deposits need to be removed in sections. And you remove one section of the deposit at a time. So there's an actual process, thought process behind this. Now this is a sickle scaler. This is one of your anterior sickle scalers, your green instruments, and you're removing the first section of calculus first, okay, and then the second section and the third section. You do a thorough removal and not just a partial removal of everything before you move on to the next section. Burnished deposits are more difficult to detect because they're smooth and they're more difficult to remove. Burnished deposits, all calculus retain plaque biofilms. All calculus does. And that uh, biofilm is associated with continuing the inflammation of the periodontal tissues. So we've got some angulation factors that need to be considered. Incorrect angulation of the working end can result in tissue injury or burnished calculus. Angulation greater than 90 degrees, you've got a blade facing the tissue and that can result in tissue injury. Angulation less than 45 degrees, you're too closed and you're just smoothing out the calculus and you're not removing it all. So large calculus deposits need to be removed in sections. You use a series of calculus removal strokes to remove the deposit one section at a time 
and correct angulation is needed to prevent tissue injury as well as burnished calculus. <laughs> All right, let's look at the sickle scalars. Now, these are your green. They're green, green in your um, instrument kit. And uh, you have two sets of them. You have an anterior and a posterior sickle scalar. What's the design of the sickle scalar? It's a periodontal instrument used to remove calculus deposits from the crowns of teeth. These were not designed and should not be used on root surfaces. Do we use them on root surfaces? Yes, but that's not what they were made for. They have a pointed tip, comes to a point, okay? And it's called a tip. It's triangular in cross section and you have two cutting edges. So you've got a cutting edge here and a cutting edge here, two cutting edges. The face of a sickle scalar is perpendicular to the lower shank. So when you hold the instrument tip towards you and the tip is facing you, this lower shank is perpendicular to the face. That is letting you know it's got one blade and two blades that are going to be used. Anterior sickles are often single-ended. We use double-ended instruments most of the time now, and they can be the same end or mirrored images, or they can have two different ends. And your anterior is a 533. One end's a five and another one's a number 33. So you have two different ends. Posterior sickle scalars are usually two sickles paired on a double-ended instrument, and they're mirror images because you'll have one side that you can use, for example, on the maxillary right buckle, and the other end will be used on the maxillary right lingual. So you have to flip them to get their mirrored images. Sickle scalars are to remove medium to large size super gingival calculus, not on root surfaces. Let's take a look at the anterior sickle scalar. We've gone over the calculus removal concepts. We want to establish that ideal degree of angulation, 60 to 80, 70 to 80. Oh my gosh, your head is spinning now because we've got the 45 to 90, that's acceptable. The ideal is 60 to 80, and now you're seeing 70 to 80, right? 60 to 70, there's not a whole lot of difference, and hopefully on the test, I've corrected numbers. If I'm asking you what the ideal angulation is, you're not going to have a choice of a 60 and a choice of a 70, okay? If I do, ugh, there's something wrong. Uh, you wanna apply the cutting edge and we're going to go step by step, okay? You're maintaining the correct modified pen grasp is really important for effective calculus removal. You want to freeze frame and pause to check your finger placement in the grasp to make sure it's correct before you initiate in, an instrumentation or calculus removal stroke, All right? And we're going to review the uh, characteristics of a calculus removal stroke, but freeze frame yourself, stop, pause, take a look at your grasp. Are your fingers together or are they separated? Do you have your soft C? What does it look like? Do you look like anything like the pictures of the book? Your calculus removal steps include stabilization with your fulcrum finger, adaptation, angulation, 70 to 80, increase your lateral pressure. The calculus removal stroke are short stroke biting strokes. They snap the calculus off and you want to go in various directions to make sure that you are covering the entire portion of whatever zone that you are working in. And that might mean a number of different strokes. So let's take a look at what your instrument looks like again. The face of the working end, okay, is at a 90 degree angle to the lower shank. 
all instruments do not look like this. Positioning the lower shank parallel to the tooth surface creates an incorrect face to tooth angulation because that means it's at a 90 degrees. If this is 90 degrees and then you've got your terminal or lower shank parallel to the long axis of the tooth, the blade is 90 degrees, which is too open. So for correct angulation, you want to tilt the lower shank towards the tooth surface just a little bit because you're going from 90 and that slight tilt is going to create that face to tooth surface angulation of 70 to 80 degrees. So you can see on the picture on the left, this terminal shank is perpendicular to the face of the blade. The face here is actually okay at a 90 degree angle and you can see where this other blade is. This would hurt the tissue versus if you take the terminal shank or lower shank and angle it towards the tooth just a little bit, the face of the blade angles towards the tooth just a little bit. And that's more correct angulation. So we've got our different seating positions and we don't want to be uh, going back and forth and back and forth and flipping instruments and, and everything. So the correct way of doing uh, the anterior teeth, for example, are to do the surfaces towards you and then do the surfaces away from you because the surfaces towards you, you're gonna be seated at say the nine o'clock position and the surfaces away from you, you're gonna be at the 11 or 12 o'clock position. So with one end of the instrument, you're seated and you're doing the surfaces towards you, which is the green, towards, 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 okay? And so you're using cutting edge one then for the surfaces away, you're actually using the other cutting edge. So this is the facial and this is the lingual. So you want to remember me, my patient, my light, my mirror, my grasp, then my finger rest and my adaptation. You begin on the anterior teeth at the midline of the tooth. Unlike the posterior teeth where it's the distal, distal line angle working in distally. On the anterior teeth, you can begin at the midline and work proximally, okay? You go in between. You position the tip third, because this is a sickle scalar, the tip third of the working end near the midline, you tilt that lower shank towards the tooth just a little bit because you don't want that 90 degree angle, you want that 70 to 80 degree angle. And just using the tip third. And you make your strokes, short strokes around the tooth. And when you're around this line angle, you really have to go one, two, whoop. You just turn that really fast with your fulcrum finger and your middle and index fingers, you're rocking and rolling it in between the teeth so you don't injure the gingiva. So you're rolling the instrument handle to maintain that adaptation of the tip third. And you continue making strokes as you work along the mesial surface. And you make sure your angulation is being constant at that 70 to 80 degrees. Again, 90 degrees, it's too much. You make sure that your strokes are at least halfway across that mesial surface because when you come in from the lingual, you wanna overlap that mesial. So you'll be sitting in one area doing the surfaces towards you. If you're just doing the facial, you'll be sitting doing the surfaces towards you, then you will swing around to the 11 or 12 o'clock position and do the surfaces away from you. When I was a student, we only had nine and 12 o'clock. We didn't have all the variations. And look what happens if you're not adapting just that tip third on the tooth. 
we as hygienists want to maximize, we've got this huge instrument, we want to maximize that cutting edge and remove as much calculus as we can. Well, that's not what it's designed for, my friends. You only want the tip third, the side tip third. Tip third of the cutting edge is to be adapted. Another common technique error is the failure to adapt that tip third or a toe third, if it's a curette, of the cutting edge to a proximal surface. So the correct technique involves rolling the instrument handle in a series of tiny movements as you move around that line angle into the proximal surface. You want to protect that papillary gingiva. So instrumentation of the proximal surfaces adjacent to the papillary gingiva can really be challenging. Number one, while you're learning, and number two, you've got this brand new instrument that is the size of a shovel that you are trying to work around this tight space of healthy tissue with. So new clinicians oftentimes will trace that pointed contour of the papilla with the working end, and that's not what you want to do. Instead, you want to position the working edge against the proximal tooth surface. You're not just tracing, you're placing that cutting edge against the proximal tooth surface so you can remove calculus that might be present. So remember what the gingiva looks like, okay? This is healthy gingiva. This is this free gingival groove here, okay? And you've got your attached gingiva. So you need to be able to get your instruments all underneath here very difficult with brand new instruments. So this particular is just showing they're tracing with that tip. They're just tracing with the tip, tracing with the tip along the gingival margin. Versus, can you see how this is underneath just a little bit? Okay, they're not doing uh, really heavy handed subgingival scaling, but they're getting underneath where that deposit is so they can pull it off. So I'm going to go back. This is not going to remove any calculus versus this is. So calculus removal strokes with the sickle scaler are short controlled strokes using an angulation between 70 to 80 degrees for calculus removal. The strokes are limited to removal of medium to large sized pieces of deposit on enamel. Okay, it's not meant for root surfaces. Let's take a look at a posterior sickle scaler. First thing you have to do is know that it's got two working ends. Right, you've got working end one and working end two here. Remember how to read your instrument. This is number 34, this is number 35. J stands for jacket scaler. You don't need to know that, but that's the name of the instrument. There are two methods that can be used to pick the correct working end. You do the same thing with your Explorer. You just will be able to see this a little bit better because it's a bigger instrument. And it doesn't matter which method you use. You have to pick what's easiest for you to do. One of them is the visual test. You're going to establish a finger rest. You place the working end in the get ready zone of the distal surface and you use that lower shank as a visual cue. So we just tell you to place it between two premolars, okay? Because you don't need to even retract. Is this lower shank parallel to the distal surface? And does the functional shank go up and over the tooth? If it does, that's the correct working end. Does it go down and around, okay? You can get this to be parallel by taking this handle and placing it all the way up and back, but then the handle is coming out of their ear. So you've got to really manipulate the angulation of the instrument by using the wrong end of it. Correct working end, incorrect working end. Or the memory method. Posterior equals parallel, functional shank 
means up and over. I don't do it that way. I'm a visual person. So let's take a look now at the cutting edges of a sickle scaler. You want to hold the instrument so that you're looking down at the face and you determine which cutting edge is closer to the handle because you're going to have one closer to the handle and one farther away from the handle. Is this one closer to the handle or farther away? Is this one closer or farther away? Okay, this is the handle. This is the closer to the handle and this is the farther from the handle. That is letting you know what the inner blade is and what the outer blade is. The inner blade is always that closest to the handle and the outer is the one that's farthest from the handle. Inner and outer. So the inner cutting edges are used on the distal surfaces and then the outer cutting edges are used for everything else. The facial, the lingual, and the mesial surfaces because you're using both ends. The memory aid is I start in for the inner surface on the distal surface, then I move out to the facial and mesial surface. I'm like I say, visual, I just stick it between two teeth. Is it up and over? Is it parallel? That's what I'm looking at. The face to tooth surface angulation should be 70 to 80 degrees. Again, you know you've got a two-bladed instrument because this lower shank, terminal shank, is perpendicular to the face of the blade. So by positioning that lower shank completely parallel to the tooth surface, you have incorrect face-to-tooth surface angulation because you're at 90 degrees and you're going to be damaging tissue. You want to be less than 90. So the correct angulation is achieved by tilting the lower shank towards the tooth surface, just a little bit. You can see the difference here. This is completely parallel, straight up and down. Okay, this lower shank is parallel. Look at where that face of the blade is. This is that outer blade, it's too opened versus by tilting in just a little bit. Look at what you're doing over on the right-hand side. You're tilting the blade or the face towards the tooth just a little bit, and it protects the gingiva, and you can snap off the calculus much more efficiently. So we've got four cutting edges because we've got two ends that we're dealing with. You've got an inner blade and an outer blade, then you've got your A, and, and your B end, right? So your inner blade and outer blade. Your inner and outer. Inner is starting at the distal. The cutting edges are applied to the mandibular molar and mandibular right, okay? So let's take a look here. You're using one blade to go into the distal facial here then you're taking the instrument out and you're rolling it. You're using the same end to do the rest of the tooth surface. Rolling the instrument to use the other blade, rolling it again to use the other blade. You're still on the same side. Then you will flip the instrument to use the other side of the instrument to do the inner blade of the other end and then the outer blade. So the inner, the distal, from the distal line angle, to the distal, that's all you're using some of these instruments for. Me, my patient, my light, my mirror, my grasp, my finger rest, my adaptation. Select the correct working end. Is this parallel to the long axis of the tooth? Is this lower shank going up and over? Again, area one, you're just using it on the distal line angle distally. Distal line angle distally. The tip third. It's not a point, it's a tip. Your 
tilting that lower shank slightly towards the tooth to close that angulation just a little bit. Seventy to eighty degrees. And you walk it distally. Then you take the instrument out, you roll it to do use the other blade, and you start on the distal facial line angle because you've already done the distal here, going in distally. Now it's the distal facial, and you're going to do the rest of the tooth. You always go in the direction the tip or toe is facing. Tilting the shank towards the tooth just a little bit. Making strokes across the facial surface and rolling it around the line angle. You roll the handle to maintain adaptation as you're tilting that lower shank towards the mesial surface. And you continue your strokes at least halfway across the mesial. So you're using the inner blade on the pink and the outer blade of the same end on the orange. Your visual cues um, help you to select the correct working end. You tilt the lower shank slightly toward the tooth to establish correct face to tooth angulation. So for primary teeth, this is a little advanced right now, but for primary teeth, uh, these primary teeth are smaller in size and the crowns prevent, uh, present more challenges because the primary crowns have rougher enamel surfaces as well as rougher CEJs. So these little guys can have a lot of calculus. So they have thinner instruments that you can use, smaller instruments for children and deciduous teeth. Children's teeth, the deciduous teeth are very curvy. They have a really pinched in waist at the CEJ. So you need to be able to manipulate around that. They have heights of contour, right? And they're very, very curvy. So you need to be able to get underneath that height of contour where that calculus might be. I have seen six-year-olds with subgingival calculus showing up on radiographs because they've either never had their teeth cleaned or they were going to a pedodontist and just having their teeth polished every six months. Um, so it, these children do need to be scaled if there's calculus. You select the working end, correct working end. You start at the distal facial line angle and work halfway across the distal. Then you take the instrument out and roll it to the other side and go from the distal facial line angle all the way around, making short strokes. Being real careful around the line angles. So let's take a look at a couple pictures. Does this look correct or incorrect? Look at how it's gouging the plastic of the typodont. You can see the entire face of the um, of this instrument. So that's letting us know that this is not tilting towards the tooth at that 70 to 80 degree angle. Is this correct or incorrect? This is showing you that tip third. Okay, so that would be more correct. This is using the middle third. Correct working end. Is this down and around or up and over? What do you want for correct working end? You want up and over. So this is the incorrect working end. So if you place this between two teeth and you see it kind of wrapping around here, you know it's wrong. And the same thing is with your ODU Explorer. It's a little more subtle, but if it wraps around the distal, it's the wrong end. This is the correct end. It's up and over. For the ODU Explorer, because it's got a little curve on it, it'll wrap around the mesial. Remember your inner versus outer cutting edge. Your A is your inner cutting edge. 
closest to the handle. B is your outer cutting edge, farthest away from the handle. Which edge is used for the distal? Okay, it would be your inner cutting edge. And then for the facial, lingual, and mesial surface, you're using the outer cutting edge. Correct or incorrect angulation? Is this completely straight up and down or is it tilting just a little bit? Look at the difference. This is tilting just a little bit. This is completely straight up and down. Very subtle. And look at the shank of the instrument too. You can see that this, the handle is coming down a little bit more. There's less space between the occlusal surface and the shank. Versus here, everything's standing up. All sorts of visual cues when you know what you're looking at. Okay, let's go and talk about subgingival calculus removal. We talked about supergingival calculus removal. Now we're going to be talking about getting underneath the gum tissue and working on root surface. And all of this has to do with your tactile sensitivity, right? because you're not going to be able to see what you're, what you're going after. You have to feel for it. Subgingival deposits are located apical to the gingival margin. Subgingival deposits can be localized or located throughout the mouth. So we really have to be on the lookout for them. We can't see them. Subgingival deposits are hidden beneath the gingival margin. They're hidden from your view. And that makes removing the deposit even more challenging. Deposits commonly located just apical to the CEJ and on the line angles and within the root furcations are commonly missed. Look at these extracted teeth. This is calculus. It isn't buried subgingival very far. There's a furcation here. And the same thing with this premolar tooth. That calculus wasn't very far subgingivoid. But the surface of the calculus is irregular at the microscopic level. And because of that irregularity, bacteria collect on it. So it's porous because it's got little holes in it, but it's still, um, it's still hard. Uh, it's a contributor to periodontal disease. Calculus itself is not the cause of periodontal disease. It's the bacteria that is the cause of periodontal disease. So removing these deposits is really important for controlling periodontal disease. And we can't see what we're doing underneath the gum tissue. So we have to rely on our sense of touch and our rely on visualization of how that instrument is adapting subgingivally. So we need to vi visualize the position of the working end underneath the gum tissue. Unhealthy periodontium in cross section. Look, this is not a regular smooth area where this call is. It's jagged and it's deep. So your instrument needs to be able to go around all of these irregularities as you're feeling for them. And look how raw this tissue is. This is going to bleed, bleed, bleed. So you want to insert the instrument 
so you're not irritating the gum tissue. And that's not just plowing and, and forcing it underneath the gum tissue. You want to gently slide the working end of your Explorer or your Curette beneath the gingival margin into the sulcus or the pocket. So during the insertion, that face to tooth surface angulation is between zero and 40 degrees. You want that face next to the tooth. That's called a closed angle when that face is next to the tooth. It's closed against the tooth. And you can see here, angulation for insertion is less than 40 degrees. You've got a rounded back here. So you can actually just slide this uh, instrument underneath the gum tissue. And that's what you're doing. You're sliding the instrument underneath the gum tissue around the calculus to get to the base of that calculus before you open up the angle. You're going in at a closed angle. So to uh, insert, you're going to establish a finger rest near the tooth. You're going to select the proper working end. You're going to prepare for insertion by placing the working end on that get ready zone. It's above the gingiva. And then you, the face is then at a closed angle as the working end slides gently to the base of the pocket. Right, so we have to, again, be visualizing what we're doing with our instrument while we're working underneath the gum tissue and we can't see what's going on under there. So steps for insertion and angulation, excuse me, me, my patient, my equipment, my grasp. You establish your finger rest in the get ready zone. You lower the handle, you insert with a closed angle, you establish angulation for deposit removal. So that means you're opening the face of the blade, you're locking that toe third of the instrument, you're locking it against the tooth or the root surface, and you make a calculus removing stroke. It's a very definitive stroke. So you've got your get ready zone, which is super gingival, then you're going to slide, you lower the handle. Now look at this, what's parallel here? Nothing. What they're trying to do is introduce this toe underneath the gum tissue. So the toe of the curette points towards the gingival margin. You're introducing that toe underneath the gum tissue. And once you're where you need to go, then you upright the handle. You're going in at a closed angle where the face is hugging the tooth surface. You insert beneath the gingival margin. These gums have been removed, sliding along the root surface. Okay, once you're in, now look at the shank. This shank has been lifted up and this is now parallel to the long axis of the tooth. You're going in obliquely to introduce the instrument. And once you're in, you raise up that shank by tilting the lower shank towards the facial surface and you're establishing that 80 degree angulation. Adapting the toe third. Curettes have toes, scalars have tips. Prepare the instrument. Okay, knee, establish finger rest, get ready zone, lower the instrument handle. So just the toe is trying to get inserted underneath the gum tissue. You're sliding the face along the tooth surface and then you return your fulcrum and handle to an upright position. Me, my patient, my equipment, my grasp. Visualization is necessary. Then we've got our periodontal instrumentation that you need to know about. And this is defined as the removal or disruption of plaque biofilm, its byproducts, and calculus deposits from the coronal and root surfaces of the teeth. And this is what we do every day, my friends. We are doing periodontal instrumentation. So the goal is to reestablish periodontal health and restore the balance between the bacterial flora and the host's immune system because our bodies all react differently to the bacteria and the pathogens in our mouths. We could have two different people with identical biofilms in the mouth and two very different 
ways their body is reacting towards it. Some people get away with it more than others. So we wanna remove completely the biofilm and calculus deposits. We want to induce positive changes in the bacterial flora because the older the bacteria is in our mouth, the more um, it's established, the more pathogenic it is because we're not removing it on a regular basis. So we wanna create an environment that permits tissue healing. We want to increase effectiveness of patient self-care because if they can't do something on a daily basis at home, no matter what we do for them in the dental chair, it's only going to be temporary. And we wanna help prevent recurrence of disease during periodontal maintenance. We're bringing them back frequently enough. Now, we sometimes uh, will be having our patient back before three months. We've done all of our scaling. Let's bring you back in six to eight weeks, see how you're doing. And that's called a reevaluation appointment. And sometimes there are non-responsive areas that just aren't healing. The root surfaces might still be having residual calculus. Now that's the number one cause. We haven't removed all the calculus. And hopefully the patient's self-care is improved and the tissue health overall is improved. So we can go into these localized areas to detect and remove any residual calculus to make sure that we've done as thorough of a job as we can. Now studies show nobody does 100%. Nobody. The best of us don't do it, no matter how hard we try. But we want to do enough so the patient can um, heal. And with that, you sometimes will get tissue shrinkage and more recession. So this is immediately after healing. All right, and sometimes that gum tissue the bone hasn't changed any, but the gum tissue will change just a little bit. This will be probing five millimeters. Look at where the CEJ is. Where is the bone radiographically? Two to three millimeters from that. And look how far the bone is. So this is going to be a pocket, residual periodontal pocket. It's very difficult for the patient to clean five millimeters subgingively versus this. They only have to clean one to two millimeters, but then they have susceptible root surfaces as well. So the goal of periodontal instrumentation is to return the tissues of the periodontium to a state of health. And health means that the periodontal tissues that are healed and they are free of inflammation. So we do a reevaluation as well as maintenance appointments to help monitor the periodontal health so we can catch things when um, they're sliding just a little bit. Let's take a look now for the subgingival calculus removal. We again are working subgingively. We're not seeing where our instrument is. We're relying on our sense of tactile sensitivity our knowledge of root surface anatomy. So it's important that we have a systematic pattern of instrument strokes that will mean that we are going to prevent missing calculus deposits. So the working end contacts the tooth surface. Same way with your scalar, it's the tip two thirds in the scalar for the curette, it's the toe third, okay? One to two millimeters, excuse me. Uh, the tip, one to two millimeter, all right? You're gonna be, um, that's all the instrument is going to be touching. You're not trying to use the entire blade of the tooth. So we're using that toe third. And for successful instrumentation, again, you need to be visualizing what is that instrument doing subgingively. And you're making different types of strokes. So you're doing uh, you're doing vertical strokes, you're doing oblique strokes, and you're doing horizontal strokes. Those horizontal strokes are good for line angles and the straight facial and straight linguals of teeth. Again, you're visualizing. You're going to think about that narrow strip you're going to be scaling. 
and you completely scale one zone before you go on to the next zone. So you're dividing up a pocket into zones, depending on how you do it. Some will divide, you start at the base of the pocket and go up, and then you're doing this whole zone before you go into zone number two, before you go into zone number three. You completely scale. We are not trying to do partial scaling. So these are called multi-directional strokes. It's a series of overlapping strokes that's produced by a sequence of your vertical, oblique, and horizontal strokes. And you have to use all three types of strokes to make sure you're not missing any areas. And that's called a cross hatch pattern. This is that cross hatch pattern. You're not missing anything. So for calculus removal, that face to tooth surface angulation is between 40 and 90. Again, the ideal angulation is 60 to 80 degrees. That's 60 to 80. All right, you want to get underneath the calculus, you're going to open up 60 to 80, and you want to actually snap that calculus off. Root debridement strokes are used to remove subgingival biofilm residual calculus or surface irregularities. Now, root, we're talking root debridement. That's different. We were talking about calculus removal here for periodontal instrumentation. Root debridement or root debridement where was I? All right, is again at that 60 to 70 degrees. Remember before it was 60 to 80? Root to Brideman is just a little bit more closed. And remember the difference between um, assessment stroke, your working stroke, and root to Brideman stroke? Pace is a little bit less. It's not as heavy handed as the calculus removal stroke and the blade is just a little more closed. The steps for your instrumentation are exactly the same. You assess the root surface with assessment strokes away from the junctional epithelium. You're going to cup that calculus deposit with the base of the curette. So you're underneath, you're at the base of that calculus. You're opening up the blade to perform that calculus removal stroke, and that's locking the toe third against the tooth surface. You're opening the face to the correct angulation, that's 60 to 70 degrees. You're using short biting strokes away from the base of the pocket. You're coming away from the base of the pocket to the sulcus. You're not pushing that calculus farther down, you're bringing it out of the pocket. All calculus deposits should be removed from one tooth before you start doing a second tooth. So when you start seeing patients, you might only have one tooth that we're allowing you to clean. It might only be one surface of one tooth. We want to make sure that you can completely finish something before you go on to another section of a tooth or another section of the mouth. Let's talk just a little bit about universal curettes now. We've gone over the scalars, which are triangular in shape. And for supragingival calculus removal, we've talked about subgingival calculus removal and what kind of instruments are going to be doing that. So let's look at some of the design characteristics. Uh, universal curette is a periodontal instrument and it's used to remove small and medium-sized calculus deposits from the crowns and roots of the teeth. Remember, the sickle scalers are just for the crowns of the teeth. This type of curette is called universal because it can be used in both anterior and posterior teeth. So the universal curette can be used to remove both supragingival and subgingival calculus in the anterior and posterior area. 
it has a rounded back. Instead of a pointed tip, it has a rounded toe. There are two cutting edges, just like your scalars, and it's a semicircle in cross section instead of being triangular like your scalar. The face of the blade is perpendicular to the lower shank, just like your scalar. So it has two cutting edges that are level with one another. So the universal curette can be used to remove small to medium sized calculus deposits. It's universal, so it can be used for both subgingival and supergingival deposits without traumatizing the tissue in both the anterior and posterior areas. There are a number of different designs of universal curette. So to select a universal curette for a particular calculus removal task, you need to consider the design characteristics. So curette A, which is on the left, has a short lower shank and working end versus curette B has a longer shank and longer working end. So A is a Columbia 1314 and B is a Barnhart. You've got the Barnhart in your kit this year for your first year kit. Next year for your second year kit, you're going to have some experience with the Columbia 1314. But look at the difference. The longer, thinner shank, longer head is going to be able to reach or longer working end will be able to reach in approximately more than a Columbia 1314. So curette A has the shorter lower shank and it's limited uh, to use within normal sulci or shallow pockets. Versus curette B has the longer lower shank. It's used on root surfaces, surfaces within the deeper pockets because it can reach farther. Look at A doesn't even go to the trunk of the root versus B is going to reaching the furcation. Instrument A, your Columbia 1314 has a shorter working end. It doesn't reach the midline of the mesial and distal surfaces of the posterior molars. So there's a possibility of missed calculus. And this dark area here is supposed to be calculus. So you have to know this about your instrument so you can adapt it to where it needs to go. Versus curette B, the uh, Barnhart, has a longer working end. And it's a better choice for the mesial and distal surfaces of molar teeth. So are you going to have both of these in a setup? No. Offices will either have or hygienists will choose. They like one over the other, and that's the one that they're going to keep in their pack. I grew up in school with a Columbia 1314. Once I graduated, I discovered the Barnhart and um, fell in love with it, and I never went back to the Columbia after that. But a lot of offices have the Columbia, so we want you to have and experience in both of them. And you might like one over the other. So it's important to examine the design characteristics when you're selecting an instrument for calculus removal. Curettes with a longer lower shank and longer working end are best in periodontal pockets and for the proximal surfaces of posterior teeth. So if it can reach the more difficult areas, it can reach the easier to reach areas as well. But let's look at the posterior, okay? We're going to uh, first need to establish the proper working end. You are working with double-ended universal curettes. So a Barnhart 1-2, and you've got a Barnhart 5-6 uh, as well, has two working ends, okay? The one end is over here, and the number two end is over here. And there are two methods that you can pick when correct, uh, choosing the correct working end. You use whatever works for you. The visual cue, you establish a finger rest, you place the working end in the get ready zone of the distal surface so your 
basically placing this between two teeth and you use the lower shank as a visual cue. The lower shank should be parallel to the distal surface and that functional shank should go up and over the tooth. No new information here. Incorrect working end, the lower shank is not parallel and that functional shank goes down and around. So you want to think for a memory, posterior equals parallel and the functional shank is up and over. So method two is that inner outer cutting edge. Remember, you've got that inner cutting edge is closest to the handle and the outer cutting edge is farthest from the handle. So you want to hold the instrument so that you're looking down at the face and you determine the cutting edge closest to the handle. Because of the bend of the shank, one cutting edge is closer. Which one? Is it this one or is it this one? And it's the lower end here that is closest to the handle. So that is the inner cutting edge. The inner cutting edges are used for the distal surfaces. The outer cutting edges are used for everything else the facial, lingual, and buccal, as well as the mesial surfaces. So I start in on the distal surface and I move out to the facial and mesial. In for inner. You want to establish angulation and that's that 70 to 80 degree face to tooth angulation. Now the face of the working end is perpendicular to that lower or terminal shank. So it is designed as far as uh, similarly to your posterior curette. I'm sorry, your posterior scalar. But you want that lower shank parallel to determine the proper working end. But by keeping that lower shank parallel, you've got an incorrect face to tooth angulation because that's going to be at 90 degrees. So just like your scalar, you want to tilt that lower shank towards the tooth surface slightly. And in this position, the face to tooth surface of the angulation is then between 70 and 80 degrees, not 90 degrees as if it was parallel. So this is parallel. The face of the blade is this way and look at where the outer edge is here, okay? This would be slicing gum tissue. So you want to tilt slightly towards the mesial and slightly towards the distal surface to close that angle just a little bit from 90 degrees to 70 to 80 degrees. So you've got two working ends two cutting edges on each working end. Cutting edges are applied to the mandibular first molar, okay? So you always start in the most posterior. You're going to be using the inner here. The inner blade goes to the distal line angle distally. Then you take the instrument out. You rotate it to use the outer blade and you're using the rest of the um, tooth surface for that blade. So the inner is only going from the distal line angle to the distal. That's it. You want to remember me, my patient, my light, my mirror, my grasp, my finger rest, and my adaptation. From the distal facial line angle, back and halfway across the distal surface is where you're starting. So you place the instrument, the working end in the get ready zone near the distal facial line angle. Okay, you don't just cram it underneath the gum tissue. The toe is always pointing or moving towards the direction that it's facing. So the tip or the toe in this instance is facing the distal, so that is the direction the instrument is moving towards. You're going to lower the handle. Again, you're gently inserting, introducing that toe underneath the tissue. 
and the face should be hugging the tooth surface. So you're lowering the handle. You're establishing angulation. Okay, so you're bringing the handle up and you lock the toe third to the tooth surface. And then you make strokes around the line angle halfway across to the distal surface, walking strokes, keeping that toe underneath the tissue the entire time. So the face should be at a 70 to 80 degree angle to the distal surface. This is tilting towards the tooth just a little bit. Then you take the instrument out, you're using the other blade. You start at the disto line angle here, distofacial line angle, and that same blade is going to go all the way around to the mesial surface. So you place the working end in the get ready zone. You're going to introduce this toe underneath the gum tissue. So you're bringing the handle down to introduce the toe, then you're bringing the handle up and the toe points forward. You're gently inserting with bringing the handle down. And you bring the handle up and you walk it across the facial surface and you roll the handle as you approach the mesiofacial line angle. You want to start rolling it before the line angle so you're keeping that toe third on the tooth at all times and it's not flying off. And be sure to extend your strokes past the midline of the mesial surface of the tooth. So when you're working from the mesial buccal and the mesial lingual, you're overlapping those areas. You start on the most distal and you work your way forward. For the maxillary, you turn the toe towards the distal surface. Again, the toe moves in the direction that it's facing. You establish a zero degree angulation to insert, to introduce that toe underneath the gum tissue. And so you can see how this shank is starting to come around a little bit because what you're doing is you're placing the handle towards the gum, okay? This is maxillary, so you're going up towards the gum. You're placing the toe underneath the gum tissue and then you're going to bring the handle down. You establish angulation, lock the toe third into the tooth surface. You make strokes around the line angle, halfway across the distal surface. So you used one blade. Now you're going to use the other blade of the same end to do the rest of the tooth surface. You're going to get this toe third introduced underneath the gum tissue. Then you write it up and you work across the facial surface and you roll that handle as you are coming across this mesial line angle. And you make sure that you're working just beyond the midline. So you wanna remember the sequence of the steps for calculus removal. Um, you use the visual cues to select the correct working end of a universal curette. Let's take a look at the lower shank position. Adapting the working end to the facial and lingual root surfaces of the mandibular posterior teeth can be challenging for two reasons. One, your hand may block the vision of the lingual surfaces. You're just getting in your own way, as well as that rounded posterior crown also makes it difficult to place the working end on the root surfaces because you've got curvy teeth. So look at the height of contour. The facial or buccal height of contour is in the cervical third here, and the lingual height of contour is in the in, uh, occlusal third. You have to be able to get that instrument around those heights of contour and still be able to envision what that instrument is doing underneath the gum tissue. One of the things that novice students do is they lower the uh, 
instrument handle when trying to view the lingual surface, okay? You aren't going to be able to see this way. But look, you've got a hand, you've got a mirror, you've got another fulcrum finger, you've got an instrument that's a lot to try and manipulate around. Tilting the handle towards you, the clinician, may make it easier to see, but look at where that instrument is. It's bouncing off the tooth. In this position, it's not possible to adapt the working end to the root surface because the root is in smaller than the crown. So at best, the toe can only be adapted. The toe itself can only be adapted. So for the mandibular lingual, you want to keep the handle in the normal position, right? Look at it. It's coming up and out. It's not coming towards the chest. You want it upright as possible. You lower the shank, okay? You're not going to be hitting against the tooth with this handle up. It's easy to make a stroke up the root surface without hitting the crown of the tooth. So for the mandibular posterior, you do not want to tilt the handle towards you. You want to keep that handle in an upright position. Let's look at horizontal strokes. Beginning clinicians often miscalculus deposit in two areas, the distofacial and distolingual line angles of posterior teeth and the midlines of the facial and lingual surfaces of anterior teeth. Now the book says beginning clinicians. I can't tell you how much residual calculus I have found with even seasoned professionals in these areas. It's the line angles and the midlines of the anterior. So this is where horizontal strokes can be effective to remove calculus at the line angles and to remove calculus at the midlines. So for the line angle to do a horizontal stroke, what you wanna do is lower the handle you insert the working end slightly distal to the distofacial line angle, and you're going to be moving this in a horizontal position using the toe third. Look at how the shank is. It's nowhere parallel, nowhere close to being parallel. But what you're doing is you're using that toe third to come around this line angle, and if there's calculus there, it will be able to catch on that calculus and snap it off. For horizontal strokes on anterior areas, you can use your universal curette. Notice that the toe is facing down. This is not parallel, and you're making a horizontal stroke this way. This is only good for shallow areas. If you had a six millimeter pocket there, the toe would not be able to reach. Horizontal strokes are good for removing calculus at the line angles of posterior teeth, as well as the midlines of anterior teeth. So let's take a look at some pictures here. Okay, so this is a probe. This is what you have. This is three millimeters. This is four millimeters and five millimeters. So at three millimeters, your probing is at a two two millimeters. This probing, okay, would be, it's covering the five, so you would reach and uh, call that a six millimeter. You can see here where the rubber or the fake gum, so to speak, is starting to, um, to tear. In this particular picture, since we're not live with discussion, what is wrong here? Can you see what's wrong with this picture? They are trying to adapt the middle third of this scalar to the tooth surface. So the tip is actually pointing and injuring the gum tissue. They're not using the tip third. Universal curettes can be used in the anterior area. We are going to show you that 
this time next year because it involves flipping the instrument for anterior versus posterior and you've got enough to worry about for that. But look at this, what's wrong with this? You wouldn't be able to get subgingibly with that, would you? You can see the entire face of the blade. I would not want to try and get that underneath gum tissue. What's going on here? The handle is down. This is not completely parallel. If the handle was down just a little bit more, this instrument would be a good instrument to do a horizontal stroke. And that is it for universal curettes, which you'll be dealing with um, uh, next week. We'll be doing the scalers as well as the, the curettes. Um, and I hope this is a good uh, overview of what next week will bring.